Pledge drive. <laughs> <laughs> Can we call it that? Can we call it that, Andy? It is. You know, we're we're just like NPR, yeah. really. I mean, so yes, we can absolutely call it a pledge drive. Um, this you're probably wondering, what is this doing in my feed? I don't I don't know what this is. Um, welcome to a member bonus episode. This is our horror debuts retake that uh, we do for <laughs> members after after we finish a series and uh, members only get it but because we're here as pete said doing our pledge drive we want to give it to you so uh you can get a little taste of what uh what you get when you sign up to be a member for the next reel i really like this this show it's still coming together the the retake but uh, i really like taking the opportunity with you to sit back and actually sort of integrate the things that we've we've learned and talked about and as you'll hear in this show uh opinions change over the course of so many movies in this gargantuan series <laughs> and uh, it's fun to explore and let our let our opinions be shifted by one another and mostly uh you know by the the whims of letterboxd and flickchart uh, as we get that done. So thank you for hanging out, for giving this one a shot. And if you like it, uh, if it's something you feel like you'd like to hear more of, it is a member episode. So uh, head over to truestory.fm slash TNR membership, become a member today, support this show and all of the shows that we do uh, by way of the next reel. Uh, it, it keeps the engine churning. Your support keeps the engine churning. And without it, we have to make harder decisions and that stinks. So please uh, give us a shot. Uh, become a member and uh, and take a look at all the fantastic bonus episodes coming this year. Enjoy it, everybody. Thanks. That was perfect. Let's try for one more. Happy retake day, Andy. <laughs> it is the hallowed day, it's the hallowed the season. It's the wonderful, time wonderful time Sometimes you year. take and sometimes you take again. And that's what we are here to celebrate as we talk about our horror debut series. Um, and it's one bonus episode that this time has already gone out. Indeed. Indeed. It did go. People will have had a chance to listen to it. And, uh, you know, I'm just excited to talk about all these wonderful horror movies all over again. This was a great series. I really enjoyed it. I did, too. And and it has I, I don't know why you make fun of me for this, but I call this a long series. And it's I, it's kind of long. It's like seven movies. That's a thing. Six movies. Like that's on the longish side. Six movies. No, Relic is in there. But you can't count the member bonus in the actual I series. I count the member bonus because this is a member bonus. Like it's all they're all part and partial of the same thing. In, yes. Well. In context of the whole thing, sure. It's one more than our last series. <laughs> so, woo! You are, you are so such long. a rule follower so sometimes. Long. Like, you just, I need you to broaden <laughs> your thinking just a, just a smidge. <laughs> Look, I feel like it was this, huh, it was long. I, it was, there were some really great movies. And I think when I look at my overall rating I, uh, of each of the films and kind of my, my overall stand, and let me just say, let the record show. We're talking about Messiah of Evil, Good Night, Mommy, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, The Baba Duke, Relic, that member bonus episode that Andy seems to want to disregard, <laughs> even though it was objectively the best movie of the entire series, The Lure, and Saint Maud. That is the set that we're talking about. And when I look at my overall rate, I had a great time with almost all of them. And I think when I look at my I, my overall rating, my star and star and hearts, stars and hearts, uh, I, I feel like I've been um, I, I've been challenged on one pair of these movies in terms of how they hit me, and and that is between uh, the Babadook and Relic, and mostly it's because uh, our community member Brian Blake won't let me forget it, and so I've been thinking a lot about it. Because his question to me was, I just don't see the difference between Relic at five stars in a heart and the Babadook at three stars in a heart. Like, I get that I like the the Relic more, but was Babadook really two whole stars less good than Relic? We watched them back to back. Uh, and you could say they have a very similar sort of structure in terms of how the films use metaphor to tell the story. One is dealing deeply with grief and loss, and one is dealing, you know, with grief and loss, with aging and dementia and and uh, Alzheimer's. <laughs> um, also, grief and loss. Right. Good point. Thank you. Um, and and so, what is it between those two movies that makes 
that makes that separation so stark for me. And I was initially hanging my hat on the performative aspects of the movie that I just like the people better in Relic. I like the relationships of those three women. I like the way they they uh, work together on screen. But I don't think I can levy that as a complaint against the Babadook. And I was already on the record as saying that I liked the kid more than you did. I don't even remember what your your rating was on that. What would you give Babadook? We both gave the Babadook three stars. Okay. Three stars and hearts. So we both, you yeah. know, we both said, and, you know, this was coming up for me because when I first watched it, I gave it two stars and a heart. For me with the Babadook, I really just, I mean, there's, I, I struggle with buying into the story of the mom and son. It's been seven years since this accident with her husband and uh, she's, nobody has talked to her about getting a counselor and. Her son is a mess, and yet nobody does anything other than her sister saying, my, my, my daughter doesn't want to have your son over for her birthday party. It's a princess party. And then she still lets mm-hmm. him come over. And, and so it's just one of those things where I struggle. And, you know, I mean, I know people are like this. It's, it's not like telling a story about, you know, completely unbelievable circumstances. But in context of me getting into that particular film, I really had a hard time with the way that the story presented the mother and son at this particular point. And I really feel it probably is just because they needed a kid who at least had a few years on him who could perform. Like, trying to do this with, like, a two-year-old would have been nigh impossible. So, um, but that would have probably, story-wise... nigh? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to bring it back. What do you think? So fancy. I know. So fancy. You know, I throw them out. should be so. called on those things. I'm going to be that one, that person for you. Okay. <laughs> So, I mean, that's, I think that's where uh, my frustrations with the Babadook is, is I just, I have a hard time connecting with the characters in the story. And uh, I appreciate what the filmmakers are doing and the journey that they put us on and the way they portray the grief over the loss of the husband as this creature that they have to deal with. I think that's very interesting. I just really struggle with those characters. And like you said, the characters for me in Relic like, I really connected 100% all the way through the entire film with uh, mother, uh, daughter, and grandmother. Like, those characters were so well fleshed out and so easy to connect to that I found that journey a much more satisfying one. Yeah, me too. Okay, so now I compare that to my rating on The Lure, which is four stars and a heart, and Messiah of Evil, which or or even Goodnight Mommy. So Messiah of Evil, I gave three stars and a heart. Goodnight Mommy, three and a half stars. I... Uh, now on reflection, now that I've had several weeks to think about this, I don't... I, I think... I don't think Goodnight Mommy is telling uh, a story that is as strong as The Babadook, right? Like, I, I don't... I don't think the the resulting reward at the end of Goodnight Mommy is near as strong as the story of this m- woman coming to terms with her grief and loss uh, in the form of this basement demon that she feeds worms. I really like that reveal in the Babadook, and that's why it ended up three stars and a heart. But I, I, you know, it's hard for me to look at Goodnight Movie, which on reflection now seven weeks ago is not as good a movie as many of the movies we've seen since. I did not like it as much, and I certainly haven't talked about it as much. And I talk about Messiah of Evil to people almost more as a as a cultist kind of knockoff joke. Like it, it again is not. It, it doesn't hold up as a uh, as a movie that is as serious to me as. Uh, Girl Walks, Babadook, Relic, the movies that we watched in the back end of the series. Uh, you know, I don't know what to, you know, really say about that other than, you know, I I think Good Night Mommy, I I prefer that to the Babadook and I would absolutely put it on really? over the Babadook. Yeah, I, I just think it's a more interesting film. And, you know, I think part of what you're looking at is maybe the fact that you appreciate that the Babadook, you know, has this metaphorical element that it's also dealing with because Good Night Mommy doesn't. It's just kind of a straight up horror film. Yeah, which is great. And I mean, that's it doesn't have to have a metaphor for me to enjoy the film. And I certainly prefer what they're doing in Goodnight Mommy and just the way that that story unfolds and the characters I find very interesting and haunting. I mean, it's a very haunting uh, film of of kids, again, kind of dealing with uh, or of a kid really dealing with grief as he's going through this this issue. And to a certain extent, his mom's dealing with grief in her own way as well. Um, And I find that much more satisfying. 
in the realm of a kind of a psychological horror film than The Babadook, which, uh, you know, makes me really work to to connect with those uh, characters. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I, I, the, the whole idea of now watching many of these movies that, you know, some of them deal heavily in metaphor and some of them truck in it much more lightly or much more, or much less sort of literally, I, I find really interesting because I, I am more attracted to the movies that do give us that sort of metaphorical lesson at the end. I like those rather than uh, the straight up horror. The straight up horror works best to me when it's cheeky, when it's like freaky, when it's, um, which was, which was fair, but like Happy Death Day, uh, that series I liked quite a lot. I, I, I guess I tend to prefer horror comedies and heavy horror when it has this sort of deeper metaphorical sort of insight right to it like lessons learned and and it really comes down to movies i'd recommend to my mother because <laughs> i have recommended only two movies uh, out of the series to my mother and those are relic and babadook and so i found those more challenging more pleasantly challenging to me hmm. interesting um, I mean, to your points about Messiah of Evil, that is a very interesting film to kind of look at and to sure. kick us off with. And I think a lot of that film, the way that we end up looking at it is through the lens of, you know, a film that was taken away from its filmmakers and kind of cut based on the, you know, the producers just wanted to get something out there. But to that end, I mean, I still think that there's a lot there and it's a very interesting kind of just very creepy film with a lot of haunting moments and it ends up and it's great looking yeah great looking it's great looking very yeah. uh you know creative um you know the story kind of is a little bit of a mess but in a weird way it does kind of uh work for the film and that certainly has elements that make me want to return to it you know it's just it's got a, a, a presence to it that i i do really like so um i i mean in in the really when i look at this entire series I ended up really enjoying all of the films quite a bit. I mean, I, I don't feel like we had any duds. I think that we ended up having a lot of interesting stories to talk about, some certainly more metaphorical than others. But but on the whole, uh, it's it's a good run. Yeah, I think if the, if there was a, like a, a low point for me, it was St. Maud. I, I think I, I liked that the least, but not because of the way it handled horror, uh, because of the way it handled story. They milked my root beer. That sounds pornographic <laughs> i didn't mean it that way they gave me milk <laughs> gave me... that's definitely sounds like something you know what would blame, be worse is if they buttermilked yeah. your milk <laughs> they Butter curdled my milk that's yeah. what they did so now here's a question though um in the context yeah. of these films that we ended up watching there was an interesting journey that we were looking at in co well i should I, maybe it's not that interesting but you know we had one film in the 70s the bulk of these were in the in the 2010s with only relic actually coming out in 2020 and so a lot of the films were very recent and uh you know so you know to a certain extent it's like what was the scare factor in these you know we didn't look at something like um you know just kind of a straight up slasher horror or something like that i mean these it was a very different type of horror that we had in all of these do you have a sense of what we were getting out of quote horror movies in this series? Well, how many of these did we come to together and say, well, this wasn't really a horror movie, right? You know, I mean, I feel like there was there was a solid creep factor in um, in Relic for sure. Uh, it, it was m much more sort of haunting and compressing, but but I mean, not gore violence by any stretch. Goodnight Mommy does have some of those elements at the end, uh, but it is much more a horror story about like terrible parenting. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh and, and dealing with the boy um yeah i mean i i feel like they were all pretty gentle on the horror front don't you like i didn't feel like be beyond relic which made me like unsettled while watching it there wasn't anything in here that felt grotesquely horror well i mean i guess it depends on what we're defining as horror i mean if it's yeah so if what it's, are you defining as horror well i i do I, I guess that i'm thinking of just kind of just straight up like you know scare factor sort of movie yeah and none of these really do that i mean there's certainly blood you know messiah of evil uh definitely i mean it starts right out of the gate with a guy getting his throat slashed open you know and so there's definitely bloody moments in that film good night mommy as you said has a lot of uh, kind of bloody moments and and things happening uh girl walks home alone at night I mean, she is a vampire. She's creeping mm, around. She eats a finger. Uh, but it's black and white, so thing. all the blood ends up just, you know, it, it 
kind of tones it down. But also, to a certain extent, as the director even said, I mean, it's kind of an Iranian Western horror film that has a a rom-com vibe. You know, she kind of put this John Hughes sort of tone to it with this romance in there. Uh, The Babadook might be the most kind of just straight kind of creature feature type of horror that we actually have. But again, not a gory film. Not gory and no one dies other than the dog. The most intense sequence is the dog. Yeah. Um, The lure, kind of a mermaid musical that's, I mean, yes, they're definitely more that kind of old school style of mermaids, kind of the sirens. So they're eating people and stuff like that. But largely it's uh, kind of more of a kind of a character musical, as we said, the mermaid room springer as they're trying to kind of figure out who they are and stuff. And uh, St. Maud, I mean, maybe that is a little more of kind of the horror. That's definitely kind of the psychological battle between two people as one of them is really going crazy and, and, and seeing and doing things. Oh, and then Relic, as you said. I mean, that's very much, to me, that was kind of more of a haunted house sort of film. So, I mean, it's a, it is a, an interesting mix that I think we're seeing. And perhaps it's just the idea that horror, you know, can reach a much broader spectrum of types of stories. And as long as it has some kind of creepy moments and scare factor, it can it still kind of falls under the horror uh, banner. I think I I think the the horror here is really hanging its hat on all of these movies on on just how unsettled the mood is to the movie. And in that regard, something like the lure absolutely fails. Uh, There's there's nothing unsettling about the mood. And that's not what they're going for. Right. I mean, that's not the intent. Uh, And still had a good time. It's it, it's also interesting because and I you know I guess I'd have to really think back through a lot of the horror films I've watched over my life but how many horror films before like this last decade started feeling like they were doing like there was a metaphorical element other than you know kind of the thematic elements but like real metaphors in their horror films. I mean do you can you think of that many horror films before like I, I, it does seem like it's really the last decade where we've started seeing this rise of this sort of use of horror film. I, I feel like any of the monster movies are are pretty useful metaphors, right? And, and um, you know, it, it, for the unknown, for whether it's technology or science, disease, like all of those things we've we've talked about extensively whenever we've talked about like Godzilla or King Kong or those kinds of things, right? They're absolutely a metaphor for something else we don't know how to handle. In, in straight up horror, I mean, I guess you could say the same thing, but I'm kind of a noob, so I don't have the catalog that you do in my at my fingertips. Well, but even, I mean, if we're thinking of things like I'm just going through the 80s, things like The Thing, Poltergeist, yeah. uh, the Halloween. I mean, you just watched all the Nightmare on Elm Street. It's the Alien franchise. I mean, yes, I guess you could say that, you know, an idea of like technology or the unknown or space or things like that, that that you are potentially more afraid of that could could hurt you, I suppose. Well, and, and Poltergeist, for example, is I would I would not I would not necessarily call that a, a horror movie, it, but it is um, it's certainly a movie that uses uh, horror tropes to have a conversation with us about family and and about, you know, the bonds that that bind us as as family members. I think that's a really uh, interesting. It's been way too long since I've seen it. It needs to be higher on my list. Well, so. you're crazy if you think it's not a horror film. Well, no, I mean, OK. All right. Tree clown puppets. I yeah. get it. Like monster in the it. closet. <laughs> You yeah, know, you're getting right. sucked okay, through into the TV. I mean, there's. Do you know what it is? Andy? I've pulling seen that your movie face so off. many. I mean, <laughs> oh god, yeah. I've seen that movie so many times because as a child that I really I remember it as like it might as well be Blue's Clues. I'm <laughs> did so it, callous. Did Disney to make all that? that? Isn't it an animated? Yeah, film? I think that's it was Steve. Steve was in that. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. No, that's a really good point. It's a it's a horror movie, but it's one that I feel like has has a, a broader story, and that's the that's that's Spielberg, right? I mean, that's. The stuff he's into. Are you saying that it's metaphorical? Like, is there a metaphorical element to, or is it just kind of a thematic look at kind of the the quietness of suburbs and you know, kind of a you know, darker bed underneath? I, I think it. I absolutely think it's thematic in terms of like strike metaphor. I need to watch it again, but I know it's a thematic sort of structural. Uh, approach to to family suburbs technology distance to uh it, it's it, to the respect that we give our history and the history of others i mean it's definitely an exploration of the sort of uh, cost of innovation to our cultural past 
and to the the Venn diagram that is different races and cultures that share space over time. And I think that's there's some really interesting things to talk about with regard to poltergeist. You know, I mean, it's it, and that makes that movie particularly interesting. And I would compare it to Nightmare on Elm Street, which we just did, which, uh, OK, I, I mean, there's some bad parents, definitely a treatise on on. <laughs> parents killing janitors <laughs> um but but it really leans so heavily into we can do this thing on camera and make it look sick let's do this thing rather than use those things to to tell a story that that gives you a real thinker at the end well i think that i mean if you look at films like hereditary and the witch i mean uh, i i think that there is an interesting uh movement in film in horror film to, I mean, I, I, I feel like if we were looking at stuff 20 years ago, that's when we had the rise of kind of the torture porn in the horror. I mean, I, I feel like there's always been kind of just a, a gen- general horror thread running through everything. For example, I haven't seen any of the Saw movies. I need you to comment on this on the well, Saw I will. movies. Is I, the Saw I, movies will. telling something bigger? No. Okay. So, well, so, I mean, in the 90s, you know, we started getting kind of a meta look at horror with kind of uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare and the Scream films and stuff like that and, and started kind of addressing kind of like what's going on in these horror films. And then I feel like they just wanted to up the gore factor. And so the torture porn really came into, um, you know, popularity with the Saw films, with stuff that Eli Roth was doing with kind of the hostile films, things like that. Like they were just like, how gross can we make this? I don't know if there's a lot of, I mean, you could probably dig for metaphors and themes, but I think it's uh, largely they were just making those films because they're, they're fun and creepy. And yeah, I mean, the Saw films definitely has a whole, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think it's a metaphor, but that whole theme of, of taking, I mean, to a certain extent, it's Fight Club. It's just, you know, a much kind of darker version of that, because I mean, that's the whole thing is like, you didn't take these chances in your life. And now you have the opportunity to take that chance or die. And that's kind of, you know, the dark place that it, they go to in that particular franchise, which is, um, you know, I, I really enjoy that, that franchise. I think it's fun, but I mean, and there certainly are some highs and lows. Yeah. We've never, we never talked about green Inferno on the show, right? You talked about it and I didn't see it. Um, you talked about it. Uh, you had it on the list of, I think, cannibal. Yeah, it was on the list. Something. It was an, I think it was an ants thing. <laughs> I don't know. It was, but but the whole thing with that movie again is like there's Eli Roth and he's he's doing so he's having a lot of fun in the cannibal horror genre space, right? I mean, he's having a delightful time in in that sort of cannibal torture porn. But he is also telling a story again of that cultural conflict, that mashup where, you know, this like these social activist college students have no business get going to this place and landing in this and and trying to do good in the space in the spirit of trying to do good, they end up really paying for it because they're getting into this into this area of uh, that that is inappropriate for for them that's the cultural clash they and and i i found it fascinating and uh, i really was entertained by it um but uh in the same thing you can say about midsummer right i mean it's this it's they're they're having a lot of fun right now i think telling these stories of you know these horror fish out of water stories these people in the spirit of doing good come into a community with established traditions and and social norms and those social norms include eating you putting you in a bear and lighting you on fire right but so they're fun to watch but they they actually i think make you think right they make you think about what business do these people have there and and uh, what business do we have when we march in with entitlement into communities that we don't understand so that that I think is really fascinating. You know, to a certain extent, you could argue the same point with his hostel films, right? You, you know, stupid college kids going and touring around and, and hooking up with people in ways that, you know, they probably are just being a little too willing to go along with certain people. And it ends up getting to them into these places where they're locked in uh, rooms and used as, uh, you know, torture opportunities for people with a lot of money who want to hurt people. So again, it's, it's, yeah, I, I think that there are these things, but what I do think is interesting is in this last decade, you did start seeing this change in, in horror films. And also 
I will say over the last few decades, I mean, you know, there are female directors who are out there directing horror films. But if I mean, if you go back to like Messiah of Evil and you start looking through the period before that, it's pretty slim pickings, if any, you know, with Messiah of Evil, which again was co-directed and then into the 80s. I mean, you do have some in the 80s, but again, it's few and far between. And then moving forward, I mean, right now in the in the 2010s, we really have seen a growth in horror film direction by women, which is great. You know, we're seeing a lot more interesting things. And I do think it's interesting that they haven't necessarily been going this route of kind of the the just straight up violence sort of things. But they're definitely this more interesting sort of horror film that's looking at, you know, kind of horror through different lenses. And like, I mean, based on what we're seeing here, I think that there's a lot of interesting elements in in these films. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, is it because they're female directors or is it just because they're taking a different approach. Well, yeah, probably a little of both. But I, I think just introducing a new sensibility to old tropes is is uh, is fascinating. I, I like what we are seeing. Did you did you end up seeing the um, the Black Christmas um, remake? Because that was I did. Okay, because I didn't. But I know we had talked about the original film in our as a as a christmas episode a while back and then this this new black christmas came out that was uh directed by by a woman sophia to call in my understanding from the trailer certainly was that they were kind of taking a more feminist approach to it did you feel like there was that angle with that particular film i i actually i did quite like the movie i gave it four stars and a heart i thought it was it was really fun uh, it, it was it did it does feel like an upgrade to the original and um it's frivolous and like they they're clearly having a good time with it there are tones of edgar wright in it uh, i had written that it doesn't quite stick the landing and then they do there's a twist on a twist on a twist on a twist kind of thing going to the movie and you know i it's a movie that absolutely uh, uh does unleash the the sort of gender politics and and i think they do it really well do you remember your review of the first one like oh, your star rating was it that high or was it i gave three and a half stars okay. it was not as high okay barely so barely barely interesting and my my review of that film i didn't enter because this was before i was entering reviews yeah, so sure, when sure. i click on it it wasn't there but i didn't give it a heart and i did give the the remake a heart okay I think there was just a thing like, you know, maybe culturally uh, in 1974, it was fine to have a movie that that just unleashes on sorority girls and gives you the like the the final girl trope and does all of these things. And it's just not fun anymore. And so now watching the sorority girls, you know, bring hell upon others is more interesting and that's uh i mean certainly was part of the trend in the 70s and 80s with horror films is kind of the slasher films and and, you know it certainly was a thing with the friday the 13th where it's like all the girls who were naughty who ended up having sex at the at the at the camp ended up getting killed and it's the virginal one who ends up surviving and you know it's like let's get tops off and even when they we're working on doing the remakes and the re-entries in these different franchises. Like when they when they did the Friday the Thirteenth, I don't know what the number would have been, but the remake essentially that was in the uh, tw- the two thousands. I think um, again, they're just going back to that same trope of just like getting the tops off and all that sort of thing. And and I think that certainly is an element, um, you know, that they're they're <laughs> you know, by bringing in different directors, by bringing in female directors modern sensibilities i think it's saying you know what why do we need to have all of that in a horror film let's you know let's just make a horror film and and use that to rely on it and we don't necessarily need to up this titillating factor to necessarily make it a film that people want to see but i think we're better for it i think there are better movies coming out of it and and if there's anything that we're learning still it's that horror films are still a great kind of starting place for for new filmmakers to get off the ground, right? I mean, all of these films, I think, stand out as uh, as something that has a voice, that there's something interesting going on here that the filmmakers themselves ended up using to kind of get other projects going. And I think that's what's, I think it's just always been the case for horror films, especially as independent cinema's uh, really been rising, is that when you don't have a lot of money, 
if you can find a way to craft something that is creepy and off-putting that you can crank out for not a lot of money, it can make a ton of money. And then you can very easily use that to kind of get your career going. Well, and here's the thing uh, to remember that for the longest time, it was um, it, it was men making horror movies. But in terms of reported uh, lovers of horror movies and the horror genre, it's pretty split, like 50, 50, 51, 49 uh, women women do love taking in this content, right? Uh, and it was at it was at PodCon some years ago. We were uh, uh, listening to a, a a story by the um, the woman who makes that true crime podcast. Um, Criminal? Cri- was it Criminal? I think it was Criminal. There's two women who do that. I don't know. And they came back and they said, that, you know, they were asked like, how do you track your audience? Who listens to your show? And it's like, oh, middle-aged white women. Like, to a person. Yeah. Like, that. those are the people who love our show. So there is there is a certain bent. It is it's one of those like gloriously overdue finalies that we have so many capable filmmakers that are women taking the reins and making these movies now, right? Making the horror movies that they want to see. Um, and uh, they're great movies. So if you were to rank the movies for yourself, how do you how do you land? All the horror movies, not just the seven we did. But start at <laughs> start, the top. Oh, start all horror movies. Okay. I'm gonna go through every <laughs> horror movie I've ever watched. Well, I mean, Relic is definitely the top for me. I mean, I that film just, I mean, it still sticks with me. Just there are moments throughout that film that were so creative and effective, and it crafted such a haunting, um, haunted house movie that uh, really, for me, had the characters that I uh, latched onto, and it stuck the landing as far as crafting the metaphor in a way that I was really not expecting, and uh, just powerful, powerful film. So that, for me, is the top. From there, I, I know I ended up ranking a lot of these four stars, so I'm trying to remember here. It's probably going to go uh, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night is next, and then Good Night, Mommy, and then... A lot of these, the rest ended up like three and a half, I'm going to guess. So I'm going to say, I think St. Maud for me. And then, boy, I'm really torn between Messiah of Evil and The Lure. They both really, I find interesting. I'm probably going to say Messiah of Evil just because there's something really creepy about that. Then The Lure and then The Babadook. Wow. Babadook is last. Oh, I mean, it's the lowest. I mean, that's the one I gave three. Everything is either three, three and a half or four stars. Or five for Relic. I think we agree on our one and two, Relic and A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. That was that yep. your number two? Yep. Okay. Uh, I I went for number three. I went with The Lure and then The Babadook and then Goodnight Mommy, Messiah of Evil, and St. Maud. And there are some star ratings that need to be adjusted in that list because that's a list I feel pretty good about. And I think... I think either Messiah of Evil, Messiah of Evil feels pretty good. Good night, mommy needs to drop, and probably the Babadook needs to go up a half star. I'm really surprised that you feel that with Good Night, Mommy because uh, that film. It's still me, a three star. It's still a competent film. Yeah, but I just I, I don't I, hate. I it. think it's more than competent. I I find that film so much uh, more effective because of how they crafted so much of the horror in that particular film and just the kind of the psychology of these boys who just need their mom and are feeling very lost or and i should say this boy but you know you know what i mean when i say that i i like that film a lot i i think generally we have a list of of great movies and i i don't not recommend any of these movies to to people if you're interested in these uh this has been a really uh, solid series should we should we rank it well i before we do i have a question for you so um uh, I'm just curious, like, so Horror Debuts, had you, uh, you know, when we posted our our list to our members to, like, pick what was going to be our September member bonus, which ended up being Relic, did you end up watching any of the other ones that people or that were on the list as options? Like, had you had you done any other Horror Debut digging at all to see what was el- what else was out there? I don't. I'd have to compare the list with my letterbox. Well, you'll remember what you'd seen. Like, here's the movies. A Mare, which was from 2009. The Slumber Party Massacre. That was the 82 movie. That was so that definitely um, throws back to something uh, that a woman directed back in the 80s. Um, Revenge from 2017. Soulmate from 2013. Mirror Mirror from 1990. And Silent House from 2011. Um, no, I didn't go watch any of those. Did you? I didn't, and uh, I'm certainly curious about them. It makes me want to now. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely want to check the films out because it, as I was digging around trying to find other options for our horror debut series, they all sounded really interesting. And so I'm, I'm certainly, my curiosity has been piqued to kind of check through that list. So I may, I may do some more watching or Hey, at the very least, we've got other options. If we, if we decide to do another addition to the horror debuts series down the road, horror debuts twos. <laughs> All right, so should we uh, should we go ahead and rank these things? Yes, get them on the on the on the chart. They need to be flicked. Oh God, you you are trying to start far too many things. It's not a quantity <laughs> over quality thing, Pete. It's a quality over quantity. <laughs> Let me help you flip. That. Well, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, first up, Messiah of Evil. I want to say mm-hmm. it like like uh, Doctor Evil. I always, I always think of um, that's that's funny. It's also him in uh, how I married or so I married an axe murderer. Mm. Fruits of the devil. Yes, absolutely. All right, first up, Messiah of Evil or High Noon? Probably um, High Noon. I, yeah, I feel like I'll go High Noon. I just, I mean, even though I had more issues with it this time, I feel like there's a very strong kind of concept going on in that film that. I probably do need to watch and, and re-rank because I feel like it's probably better than I uh, keep giving it credit for. But um, it certainly is a, a strong concept for a film. Next up, Messiah of Evil or Scarface. Hmm. I'm curious on that one. Where do you land? I'm going to say Messiah of Evil. I mean, maybe it's also because it's half the length of Scarface, but... <laughs> I mean, Scarface is a strong film, but I've never connected with it like a lot of people seem to i think that pacino is definitely over the top and big in that film uh, but i just i end up always struggling with the film itself so uh, and messiah of evil i think that there's a real element to kind of the the creep factor that they've created in that so i'll go with that one okay i'm gonna represent the other people even though i don't feel terribly strongly about it <laughs> okay. i feel like we should we should pop it open here let's do it okay here we go uh-huh. a one two, two three, three. Scissors. scissors, paper, paper. Scissors. scissors, paper. Scissors. <laughs> Scarface that was a real volley. It. <laughs> it was. It definitely was. <laughs> Messiah of Evil or Year of the Dragon. I know Messiah you of evil. love that movie. <laughs> God, hands down. I cannot answer fast enough. Yeah, I'll say Messiah of Evil also. Messiah of Evil or Danger Diabolic. Hmm. I'll say Danger <laughs> Diabolic. <laughs> I genuinely enjoyed Whack-a- that film. Wackadoo movie. I'll give you Danger Dive. All right. This little treat. Messiah of Evil or Duck, you sucker. I'll say Duck, you sucker. Duck, you sucker. Messiah of Evil or Say Anything. I'll say Say Anything. <laughs> say Anything. Messiah of Evil or Amor. Amor. Um, it's such a hard movie to watch. <laughs> I'm going to say Messiah of Evil because despite the the strength of a more Messiah of Evil is a more fun watch. Okay. So here we go. One, One two, two, three. three. Rock. Rock. Scissors. 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 Rock. You are cheating and still lost. Yeah, I'm not cheating. <laughs> yeah, Obviously, I lost. So. You're taking advantage of the delay. <laughs> and you're trying to distract me with your glasses. <laughs> All right. So, so um, Messiah of Evil or National Lampoon's European Vacation. Oh, dear. Messiah of Evil. Yeah, me too. Messiah of Evil or Salvador? <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> Salvador. <laughs> well, Salvador. Salvador. I'm saying it like I did there. Okay. Messiah of Evil. Is that what they all sound like? That's all of them. <laughs> um, I'm going to say Messiah of Evil. Okay. Oh, well, that lands Messiah of Evil in spot 456 on our chart. 456 Oof. out of 525. Pretty low. That's a 13%. Yeah. Uh, if it were up to me, it would have been higher, but hey, I was losing. So what are you going to do? All right. Good night, mommy. Uh, you're going to sink this one too. Let's see where we go with this. You, uh, uh, good night, mommy or high noon. High noon. I'll say high noon. Good night, mommy or okay. the lonely guy. Good night, mommy. A good night, mommy. Good night, mommy or once upon a time in America. Ooh, it's mm. a tough one. I'll say good night, mommy. Okay, once upon a time. All right, here we go. One, one two, two, three. three. Paper. Scissors. Not my day. Once upon a time takes it. Good night, mommy, or beneath the planet of the apes. 
the second of our apes films. You know, I go good night, mommy, on this. Um, I'll say good night, mommy, as well. Good night, mommy, or labyrinth. Oh, labyrinth for me. <laughs> okay, labyrinth. Good night, mommy, or die hard with a vengeance. That's number three in that franchise, aka Simon die says, hard. die hard. Um, it is die hard. I'll say die hard. It's a fun one. Good night, mommy, or it happened one night. Oh, that. it happened one night. Absolutely, it happened one Why night. Why is that so low on our chart? I don't know. Good night, mommy, or lady vengeance. Reacted. I really need to watch that oh. one again. Oh, that's the one with the classroom at the end. I, I, I remember zero it. about that movie. Like, I know I watched it. Why do I remember nothing about it? I'm going to say goodnight, Mommy. I know. Lady Vengeance. Oh. Okay, here we go. Well, one, one, two, two three. three. Paper. Scissors. Lady Vengeance takes it. Goodnight, Mommy, or the Thin Man. I'll say goodnight, Mommy. Thin Man. Wow. Okay, here we go. One, <gasps> two. two. Three. Three. Scissors. Rock. Andy, what's going on? I don't know. I am starting to get uncomfortable. <laughs> the thin man takes it. Good night, mommy, or die hard two. <laughs> die harder. Die hard two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, Renny. Renny, Renny, Renny. Uh, I'm going to say good night. It's the I'll, Stapleton I'll, Airport I'll, factor. I'll say die hard two. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. That lands good night, mommy, in spot 362 on our chart. 362 out of 526 is a 31%. Uh, my my Rochambeauing is terrible. Yeah, we're struggling. Um, all right, next up, we talked about a girl walks home alone at night. 2014, Anna Lily Amir Poor. First up, a girl walks home alone at night or creep show. <sighs> <laughs> creep show for me. Uh, girl walks home alone at night, Andy. All right, here we go. One, two, two three, three, paper. 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 Rock. Okay. <laughs> All right. Creep Show takes it. I feel like I did not do a service to listeners or frankly to you by losing that one. A girl walks, I, you know, it's flick chart. Like, I want to punch flick chart in the face all the time. <laughs> Things are in weird places. A girl walks home alone at night or the lonely guy. A girl walks, girl walks home. home. Girl walks home alone at night or infernal affairs. Infernal, infernal affairs. affairs. Girl walks home alone at night or beneath the planet of the apes. Girl, girl walks, walks home. home. Girl walks home alone at night or Sophie's Choice. I'd probably put on Girl Walks Home first. Yeah. Girl walks home. Sophie's or, Choice, man. I know. I know. A girl walks home alone at night or no. Girl walks home. Girl walks home. A girl walks home alone at night or The Magnificent Seven, the original 1960 version. Speaking of Western. Magnificent Seven. I will say a girl walks home. Oh, no. I'll say Magnificent Seven. A girl walks home alone at night or Gremlins. Oh, Gremlins. Gremlins. Girl walks home alone at night or Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Girl walks home. Girl walks home alone at night. That lands Girl Walks Home Alone at Night in spot 337 on our chart. 337 out of uh, five something. 564. Is that right? Or is it 36? No, out no, of 527. Five, sorry. Uh, 36% no. on our chart. Okay. All right. The Baba Duke. All right. The Baba Duke or Creep Show. Creep Show, please. Don't you dare. Don't you. <laughs> what you were saying? Do it. Do, do what you it? must. Do what you must. Creep Show. Thank you. <laughs> the Babadook or Scarface. <laughs> um, I'll say Scarface. All right, I'll say Babadook. Okay, here we go. One, One two, two, three. three. Rock. Oh, Andy has turned it around Finally. now two in a row. Okay. Uh, the Babadook or I Shot Andy Warhol. Hmm. Very ah, unlikable protagonist in that film. She doesn't save a cat either. <laughs> no truth. I'll s- I still have her manifesto in my <laughs> inbox. Jeez. I'll say the Babadook as well. The ba- Babadook or Danger Diabolic. Um, I'll say the Babadook. Danger by Diabolic. Here we go. All right. One, One two, two, three. three paper. There you go. Danger Diabolic takes it. The Babadook or Duck You Sucker. I'll say Duck You Sucker. Duck You Sucker. The Babadook or Say Anything. I'll say Say Anything. Say Anything. The Babadook or Amor. <laughs> Oh, Amor. Same path. Oh, geez. Oh, I'll say Amor. 
You know what movie's not metaphorical? Amor. <laughs> it's just straight up. Yeah. Truth. All right. The Babadook or Salvador? I'll say Salvador. Salvador. Uh, the Babadook or National Lampoon's European vacation? I'll say the Babadook. Babadook. All right. Well, that lands the Babadook in spot 460 on our chart. 460 out of 528. 13%. Ooh, down there with Messiah of Evil. The Lure. From 2015, Agnieszka Smozinska's film, The Lure, or Real Genius? Ooh, Real Genius. Wow. Okay, Real Genius, but that's a bummer. I know. Well, I... The Lure or The Lonely Guy? I will say The Lure. The Lure. The Lure or Point Break? Ooh. (laughs) Interesting. I'm going to go with Point Break. Uh, I'm going to go with The Lure. Okay, here we go. One. One. Two, Two, three, three rock, rock, scissors, scissors. scissors. Oh, the lure takes it. All right. The lure or Rocky Three. This is the Mr. T's showdown. Oh, I'll say the lure. There's a fool has been pitied. I will say the lure <laughs> as well. The lure or Joe versus the volcano. Oh, Joe. Joe versus the volcano with a bullet. The lure or Carrie. I will say Carrie. I think there's a there's a good carry vibe that I'm feeling right now, but I don't uh, really struggling with it. All right, I'll give it to you. Okay. The Lure or A Star is Born 1937. That's the Janet Gaynor Frederick March. I say version. The Lure. I'm going to say A Star is Born. I really liked that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. All right, here Let's we go. One, two, two, three, three paper. scissors. The lure takes it. The lure or Princess Mononoke. I will say Princess Mononoke. Princess Mononoke. The lure or Robin Hood 2010, Ridley Scott's version with Russell Crowe. I will say the lure. The lure. Well, that lands the lure in spot 292 on our chart. 292 out of 529. That puts it at a 45%. We're up to St. Maud. Pretty sure that's how they say it in the movie. I think it is. Yeah. That's how it's written in the Bible. St. <laughs> Maud or Real Genius? Oh, Real Genius again. Real Genius. St. Maud or The Lonely Guy? I will say St. Maud. St. Maud. St. Maud or Point Break? Ooh, I'll say Point Break. Point Break. St. Maud or Good Night, Mommy? I will say Good Night, Mommy. Good Night, Mommy. St. Maud or Alice doesn't live here anymore. Alice doesn't live here anymore. You could say that Katie doesn't live here anymore. St. Maud. You could. Hmm. Ooh. I'm going to say St. Maud. And, and here we go. One, One two, two, three. three. Paper. Scissors. Oh, Alice takes it. Mm-hmm. St. Maud or The Host. St. Maud for me. The Host. Oh, we... <laughs> come on. Here we go. One, One two, two, three. three. Scissors. Rock. Uh, the Host takes it. St. Maud or La Femme Nikita. Love him, Nikita. Take mod. Here we go. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> One. One. Two. two three, three. Paper. Scissors. Jeez. Take mod or look who's talking. Take mod. <sighs> look who's talking. I think you're forcing yourself to hate Saint Maud more than you did. No, I'm forcing myself to hate you right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> if that's how we got to do it. Uh, here we go. One. One. Two. two three. three. Rock. Paper. Jeez. I didn't even, I wanted to lose. I set an Saint, intention. Lose Saint Maud or Rabid? <laughs> oh, Rabid. A hundred percent. Saint Maud. Here we go. One, One two, two, three. three. Rock. Andy? Jesus Christ. Freaking show up, will you? Saint Maud or Scarface? I will say Saint Maud. <laughs> Saint Maud. I can't bear it anymore. Uh, 397 <laughs> out of 530 on a chart. 25%. Last but not least, Relic. Holy <laughs> criminy. <This is> <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Relic or the bank job? I will say Relic. Relic. <laughs> relic or Memento? Oh, wow. I got to say Memento. Memento. 
Relic or Night of the Living Dead? Night uh, of the Living 1968. Dead. I'll say Night of the Living Dead as well. Relic or Hero? Some Zhang Yimou. Uh, mm, lovely. Ooh. Hmm. Relic. Relic. I think it would be harder if it was Crouching Tiger, probably. Relic or About a Boy? Oh, About a Boy for me. Yeah, About a Boy. Relic or Local Hero? I will say Relic. <sighs> local Hero was adorable. Yeah. All right, Relic. Relic or The Abyss? The Abyss. The Abyss. Relic or Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance? Relic for me. Relic, yeah. Relic or Mother? Oh. Wow. We haven't had that one come up in a while. I'm going to say Mother. Okay. Me too. I, that's what I really want to rewatch that. It's mm-hmm. been on my rewatch list for a while. Uh, Relic ended up in spot 221 on our chart out of 531. That puts it at a 58%. That's really interesting. It was a chart. five-star movie for both of us that it didn't break the top 100. Well, yeah. But again, we've talked about so many movies that we like. It's very challenging. All right. So let me see where all of these movies are now. So that ends up putting Relic in our number one spot. Uh, Number two is The Lure. Wow. Number three is Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Number four is Goodnight Mommy. Number five is St. Maud. Number six is Messiah of Evil. And The Babadook is number seven. The Babadook is number seven. Yeah, so that's fine with me. (laughs) Man, that's fascinating. Especially given, I think, across the board, how high our stars were. Like, we didn't have a a one or two star movie in this lot. They're all, I think, they're all three stars or higher. Right? What is, what has happened to us? Well, it's just like, it's that middle block, right? And it used to be the old brother block. Today, it was, uh, you know, some other films. But it's just like, when you hit that block and it forces it immediately into the bottom half. I mean, that just, that makes it hard. Yeah. Makes it hard. I'm surprised that some of them didn't like as soon as they dropped into the bottom half, didn't like rise up to the middle. Yeah, uh, me too. You know, but uh it is what it is. So That's anyway, hard. we'll 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 get that list updated over in our uh letterbox headquarters and um we'll have the full list in click chart order up there so you can check out all those movies. And holy cow, we're gonna be starting our next series, which takes us through the end of the year to celebrate our tenth anniversary. Yeah, ten year films. And we're starting year. with uh, 17 Girls. Seven, 17 Fees. Yeah. As you taught me to say. It's, uh, can't wait for you did to you watch, watch it movie. already? Yeah. Dead. Oh, wow. Look at you. Dead. I watched it the night we, uh, just like two or three nights ago when we recorded St. Maud. I watched it that oh, night. okay. And uh, I'm curious oof. to know if you found it as uh, kind of boring and tedious as, um, as uh, our listener Ben Lott found it when he reviewed it. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> okay, okay, a lot of so a lot just knew, happened there. <laughs> all I knew that was a real roller coaster. All I knew of that movie is that Ben had written saying that one movie was boring and tedious, and one movie was the best movie that he's seen of the year, or something like that. And I didn't know which one they were. I had completely misplaced that in my head. I and things make more sense now. <laughs> to me they make more sense it's, it's all coming clear <laughs> so funny so funny uh but no it is going to be a fun series uh, we are going to be looking at uh starting with 17 fees directed by um the uh, is it Kulin Kulin sisters i'm not sure how to say that but uh muriel and delphine Kulin. Coulon. Oh, that's a great name you're a, you know all this i'm not looking at it i'm not looking oh. at it well, it's C-O-U-L-I-N. Coulin? Yeah, Coulon. probably Coulin. Coulin. Uh, we have Miranda July's The Future. We have Hard Labor, directed by Juliana Rojas and Marco Dutra. We have Pariah from D. Rees. We have Tomboy from Celine Siama. We have We Need to Talk About Kevin from Lynn Ramsey. Where Do We Go Now from Nadine Labaki. Zindagi Namalegi Dubara by uh, Zoya Akhtar. A Simple Life by Anne Hui which is actually also a crossover into the next series. Yep. Um, but we put it second to last because we're ending with our holiday film, Arthur Christmas, directed by Sarah Smith. And, uh, you know, 10 films that are 10 years old this year. And I'm very excited to just kind of look and see, you know, how, how do these films 
stand the test of time. I mean, certainly, you don't hear a lot of people talking about a lot of these films, but uh, I still think it's interesting to kind of look at them and get a sense. Do, are they still relevant? Do they, like us, do they really kind of stand the test of time and, and hold up all these years later? Can't wait. It's going to be awesome. We should also just throw out there that there may be a special 10th anniversary bonus episode that we might be dropping this coming um, anniversary as well, which is uh, November 11th, if people are wondering. Yeah, November 11th, 11, 11, at 11. 11, 11, 11. 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. A lot of 11s. Mm -hmm, um, so many. All right. We need a shirt. 11, 11, 11. Okay. The next reel. That's, that'll be our anniversary that'll shirt. That'll be our It'll anniversary be shirt. It'll be out there. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. 11, 11, 11. TNR, 11, 11, 11, 11. That's right. Yeah. Um, all right. Any last thoughts on this one? No, nope. this is good. Had a good time with it. Ready to move on. Well, remember, everybody, um, we want to know what you're thinking about uh, the movies. And with our 10-year uh, coming up and our 10th anniversary series, Watch those movies. Send us your thoughts. You can send a 30-second-ish audio clip to reviews at truestory.fm. We just might throw it into the show. And it's a great way to just kind of, you know, kind of be a part of the conversation. So um, thanks, everybody. We appreciate it. You've and been retook. It. Oh, dear. How about that? Is that going to go? Yeah. You're gonna, All right. No, just, yeah. Uh, All right. Until... Uh, and, and just so you know, this next episode, this next series, Pete, ten episodes. So I know it's so long. That, there's a long episode, so long. long series. So everybody, know. we'll see you uh, back here for the retake, ten episodes from now. Retook. Perfect. Let's just do one more.